results uh, related to our family, our family quantum gas microscope. Um, I don't need uh, much introduction now in this third day of workshop uh, about uh, our platform, which are uh, cold atoms, cold lithium atoms in, uh, in an optical lattice. Uh, in surprise, we are trying to look at uh, the Tommy Hubbard model uh, in this system. So maybe to give you, to give people not familiar with cold atomic systems, a bit of, of background in terms of energy scales, uh, we are able to, to implement uh, uh, the Fermi Hubbard mo model with uh, tunneling scales of about uh, a few tens of nanokelvins uh, corresponding to tunneling uh, rates of about uh, one kilohertz. I cannot hear you. Okay, just. <laughs> 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 that was turned on, right? It's off now. The light was on. Oh, it should be fine. Now? It's fine? Huh? Say something? Hello? Yeah. Yeah. It's okay? Cool. All right. So, yeah, we are implementing the Fermi Hubbard model uh, with uh, tunable interactions controlled by a feedback resonance. Uh, and uh, very importantly, experimentally, um, typically uh, these um, optical lattices come with a bit of disorder or harmonic confinement, um, which, uh, you know, using exponential techniques, you can try to reduce down to uh, energy scales on site uh, potentials that are uh, regulated up to a fraction of the tunneling. And so, uh, something which is very uh, very uh, important uh, in our experiment and, uh, and pretty uh, really useful is the fact that we are able to generate using digital micromirror devices. Uh, um, we have a, a very good control over the local density and local potential in order to create uh, uh, either very flat potentials over 400 sites or creating uh, uh, very small defects uh, at the order of a local like a lattice sites uh, in a very, very controlled way. And together with um, um, very low temperatures, typically, oh, I'm giving a, a lot of things away. And together with low temperatures, so uh, like historically, uh, five years ago, about a quarter of the tunneling uh, or half the spin exchange energy, we were able to look at the spin-spin correlations and observe uh, long-range antiform magnetic correlations extending over our entire system size. And so uh, now is the third day of this, of this workshop and I would like to maybe tie a bit to previous talks, comments, uh, discussions we've had. Uh, I think uh, uh, maybe there are two maybe, uh, questions and uh, like uh, discussions I would take back home uh, from, this, uh, from discussions that we had concerning the Fermi Harbat model. Uh, first, uh, uh, maybe from an experimentalist point of view, how can we make sense of different measurements and different observables we do on the one hand in the cold atom community and especially in quantum gas microscopes where we uh, talk a lot in terms of uh, like multi-point correlations and, uh, and re uh, like, uh, um, real space resolved observables and on the other hand uh, the typical observables you see in condensed matter uh, maybe spectroscopy of transport, how can you make uh, these two different kinds of observables and uh, measurements uh, converse and, uh, and converge and, 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 and match with each other? It's one important point. And maybe from a very fundamental point of view, um, a big uh, um, important question, fundamental question, is whether this plain vanilla uh, Hubbard model really describes the phase diagram uh, of the cup rates uh, that has been investigated for so long and we've heard uh, like pretty compelling uh, <laughs> talks and arguments uh, from, 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 from our uh, theorists uh, here to, to say that uh, uh, band structure and effects from band structure and in particular uh, extra tunneling terms in the Hamiltonian uh, that might frustrate the system are very important to understand uh, the fate of the phases of the, or, or, or the, phases of, of the diagram at low temperature. And so my talk will try to address these two questions uh, uh, in two, two parts. Uh, I'll first focus on uh, results we published um, last year, uh, which is really related to uh, the dynamical response of a single hole created on top of a Martin insulator and see how we can map it to other experiments that have been done in kind of And uh, in the spirit of a workshop where uh, we 
would like to, to show you know, the, the latest uh, state of the research. I'll show you uh, more like our latest uh, like preliminary results related to an upgrade, an experimental upgrade we have been implementing in order to go beyond square lattice geometries. But let's start now with um, this uh, first uh, part uh, about whole dynamics. Uh, we've heard like pretty, pretty nice talks uh, from, uh, from Timon and from Yao uh, yesterday and on Monday about uh, microscopic signatures of doping in the Fermi Hubbard model uh, as uh, measured with quantum gas microscopes. There has been um, like a wealth of experiments uh, by now uh, been done uh, with cold atoms. Uh, looking, for example, at spin-spin hole or spin-spin hole, uh, spin-spin double correlations across a, a range of, uh, of dopings um, at finite temperature. Uh, we have been also looking uh, a few years ago uh, in Marco's group uh, at string observables that uh, could also give some uh, some information about about the nature of the of these uh, doped uh, doped phases. But I what I would like to emphasize here is that all these uh, measurements made in the 2D Fermat model are done at equilibrium. And of course, if you want to try to relate these measurements to condensed matter experiments, you might want also to look at excitations, which are easily probed uh, by a spectroscopy or transport. So if you want to look at excitations, what's somehow the minimal, like more paradigmatic model, like a problem you can look at? Um, and that's going to be the, the topic of this talk. Uh, we are looking at a single hole in a Martin insulator, which is uh, maybe a bit simplistic uh, for, for some, some people, but uh, on the other hand, it's a, it's a very, like one of the earliest toy models uh, that has been historically studied uh, for investigating uh, doped quantum magnets uh, already, already a while ago, and, uh, and they are like pretty uh, you know, interesting things to say about that. Uh, defining features that because of the interplay between a single hole and its neighboring spins in an antiferromagnetic phase, you expect to have some polaronic behavior. And uh, uh, this polaron quasi-particle excitation, you can really see maybe in two limits. Uh, in the limit of weak coupling, uh, spin exchange energy J being very much smaller than a turning, you can really see it as a single hole impurity being dressed and bearing, scattering with spin excitations uh, in an antiferromagnet. Uh, uh, which are, for example, magnets. In the strong coupling regime, you can have uh, an alternative picture where essentially the whole uh, excitation is, is bound uh, to spin excitation uh, into, uh, into composite uh, quasi-particle. Mata, it's, J, it's I think the other way around, right? Strong and weak coupling. Okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we want to, uh, to now observe uh, uh, how this uh, uh, tunneling and spin exchange, um, yeah, please correct uh, uh, <laughs> JNT in the pictures you're taking from this slide. Uh, we want to observe how uh, these tunneling and spin exchange energies uh, appear in the dynamical response um, uh, that, uh, that we are studying with our quantum gas microscope. So the experiment we are doing here is a, a very, very specific, uh, I need to emphasize uh, much that, uh, you know, what you get from this kind of measurements really depends on the initial, uh, initial preparation conditions. Here, quantum gas microscopes really allow you to very, very nicely deterministically prepare localized dopants uh, in, the, in, a, in, a, in a mod insulator with anti correlations. And what we do is to essentially quench uh, the motion of that dopant by releasing very abruptly a pinning repulsive potential, which is creating the hole inside this, uh, this sea of anti correlations. And I have to emphasize it's a very far off equilibrium uh, process uh, because of this abrupt quench, you are projecting, uh, you know, uh, over like many many excitations, quasi excitations in your system, and you are looking essentially at the uh, coherent and incoherent uh, superposition of uh, of these excitations, and that's in strong contrast with uh, the typical spectroscopic probes you can uh, you can see you can have in condensed matter, RPS, Bragg spectroscopy, where you are really measuring uh, low energy excitations at finite at the finite momentum, and so. Maybe the closest uh, RPS measurements uh, that uh, I found to, to really uh, describe this, uh, uh, this uh, question of a single hole in, a, in an antiform magnet is, uh, is this kind of RPS experiment essentially probing the, the quasi-particle uh, band uh, as a function of momentum, which in principle should be renormalized uh, by the spin exchange energy J, but uh, well, uh, practically uh, there is a bit of disagreement between uh, 
between the experimental measurements and what is expected from, from theory. And so what can we say more now using the, the clean systems, the clean pole atom systems we have? Uh, that's, that's what we want to look at um, now. Let me emphasize that, uh, you know, this tension between localized real space uh, observables and uh, let's say spectroscopic observables uh, we have also in, in cold atoms. Uh, if you look at a very uh, closely related uh, problem, which is 1D Fermionic systems uh, with, uh, with interactions. Uh, you have spin charge separations, which has been seen uh, in real space in Immanuel Bloch's group um, a few years ago. And uh, we have seen on Monday uh, in uh, Randy Hewlett's talk how you can also probe spin charge separation now in a continuum, continuous 1D system uh, from uh, Bragg spectroscopy. So these are the two like, uh, sides of this, uh, of this coin. Can you explain what's the disagreement between experiment and theory? On the formation. On which one? On the upper right one. This one. Yeah. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, the uh, the measured bandwidth uh, is uh, is actually smaller than uh, than, than what uh, has been predicted. Uh, no, that's my experiment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <sorry. laughs> okay. The theory predicts 2.2 J. Okay. The J can be independently measured by okay. neutron scattering and end up with. <laughs> about 300 millivolts. That was one of the things we saw is very proud of the okay. actual agreement. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm very glad that uh, you're in the audience to really correct me on this. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Yes, but, but there was some, uh, remember we discussed it before, and you said spectral weight, right, in theory, comes out to be larger than yes, the Yes, but the heat, this is the dispersion, but there's a spectral weight and a shape. And shape is different, yeah. right, because there are more shape-offs. Yeah. Okay. That's a, a I would say, higher order subtleties. Sort of okay, so we want to be uh, able to do as good as you do, as you did, and to be able to. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's wonderful because we have two communities uh, at least have the interface. Yeah. Of, yeah. yeah. So, okay. Uh, Essentially, so now from, from, from this, uh, this introduction, I want to just show yeah, how... You can blame you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. We want to show how we can see signs of J uh, in the whole dynamics here in real space. Uh, and so in terms of measurements, uh, we can look at density observables. So start uh, with a localized hole and see how uh, it delocalizes over time and what's the, uh, like the, its average distance from the center as a function of time. At very short time, uh, we see a ballistic propagation, uh, which is comparable, compatible with the free quantum work determined by the ptolemy. Uh, and as uh, time passes by, we see actually that this uh, hole uh, velocity is strongly reduced. Uh, uh, which is uh, uh, something you can intuitively see in uh, real space uh, by thinking about the, the motion of a single hole in a near antiferro magnet. As the hole is moving, uh, the hole is creating some frustrated bumps which cost energy and need to, uh, to slow down the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the hole. Uh, now, where do we see the effect of J in this long-term dynamics, which might be you know, the, the, the determined by the, by the, the, by the polar dynamics? Uh, what we can do nicely in uh, polar experiments is to change the on-site interaction uh, U independently of T, which allows us to essentially decrease uh, uh, the spin exchange interaction again independently of T. So that's what we do between this blue line and this green line. The first uh, part which is detect, uh, dictated by the tunneling is uh, overlaps, but at longer times we see essentially a renormalization of the velocity of the hole uh, with, uh, with J. And so that's, uh, that's very, very nice. Uh, we have a good qualitative agreement with uh, some models we had for polar dynamics, and uh, again, uh, we see uh, really these two effects, both of the tunneling and the spin exchange energy uh, as a function of time in our whole, day, uh, whole dynamics. Uh, what we can look at as, as well is not only density observables, but also spin observables. We can look at spin correlations and how uh, the hole as it's moving uh, can disrupt the spin order. And there too, I mean, I will be brief here, but uh, there too we can see actually uh, these two time scales dictated by T and J appearing in some of the spin, uh, spin correlations in our system. Um, uh, essentially, at short times, uh, we see some kind of dynamical frustration uh, created by the motion of a hole over a neighboring lattice site, uh, which creates some, uh, some extra frustration and some bonds, uh, which is very similar to what uh, uh, um, you know, people in Emmanuel Bloch's group, uh, uh, like Timon, uh, um, um, Tim and Christian have seen uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, frustration uh, in ferromagnetic and anti-ferromagnetic correlations uh, around, around the hole. 
And uh, we get also a pretty good agreement uh, with, uh, with the phenomenological model we have to to this system. So we have, you can find more details about this model and more, more observables in, uh, in our publication. All right, uh, I'll now move on to something that has been uh, you know, exciting us uh, in the last, uh, in, in the last uh, two years, about two years. Uh, essentially trying to uh, reach geometries which are different than the, than the, than the square lattice. I'll be a bit uh, like technical and, uh, and uh, like targeting these first four slides to call it an experimentalist uh, for you to appreciate a bit uh, uh, the work we put in there. Um, so the tunable lattice geometry we, we're implementing uh, has been uh, pioneered in, uh, in Tillman's group uh, a few years ago now, uh, inspired by previous works uh, in the group of Trey Portal. And uh, in principle, it's actually quite simple. Um, you start with a normal uh, two-dimensional lattice, which is created by a pair of orthogonal uh, standing waves which are detuned relative to each other in order to kill off uh, the interference term and have a perfect square lattice. And the trick here is to apply, to add uh, in addition a super lattice beam uh, called X, which is actually not detuned with respect to this Y beam, which is interfering with the Y beam. And uh, this interference pattern can be really seen as uh, killing off every other site. Uh, on that square lattice uh, and, uh, and, uh, and leading to uh, a square pattern rotated by 45 degrees with an enhanced uh, lattice spacing, uh, enhanced by a square, a square root of 2. And the technical challenge here is to be able to stabilize the relative phase between these two interfering beams uh, in order for this interfering pattern to be uh, intensity uh, like uh, stable in potential. So that's, uh, that's uh, that's, uh, that requires quite, uh, quite a bit of thought and, and work, how it works properly. Uh, in Tillman's group, uh, so, um, they have been able to demonstrate a variety of geometries. So between, uh, by changing the relative intensity between these different beams, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, achieve honeycomb lattices uh, with direct points, uh, diamond lattices, also triangular lattices. And, uh, and there has been a wealth of, of nice results coming from, 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 from this group. Uh, in our group, uh, so we have spent uh, quite a lot of time to reveal the entire setup uh, as well as, it, as its control electronics. Uh, we have tried to improve on the noise performance on, on, of our laser, pointing stability to reduce te uh, technical heating and also try to, to reach lower temperatures. Uh, maybe for the expert list in the audience, uh, we have had to deal with some uh, sub subtleties and complications due to the fact uh, our lattices uh, are reflected off uh, verti vertically onto a substrate uh, located below our microscope objective in order to enhance, uh, enhance lattice depth and uh, create a very uh, well-defined uh, vertical layer into, the, the atoms are, into which the atoms are loaded. But that leads to uh, several complications due to the presence possibly of scatterers in the substrate, uh, um, stray reflections, you need also to be able to align this lattice uh, angle quite precisely, and you need also to deal with polarization effects uh, onto that substrate. Uh, the final setup, uh, as a result of these complications, includes five beams, uh, two high-power peeling lattices, which we use for imaging, as well as the three physics lattices uh, that I've shown in the previous slide, uh, realizing these different lattice geometries. And uh, the experimental uh, you know, what we got in, uh, in the experiment after all these efforts was essentially to see the like, what insulators in these new lattices. So let's not consider the full interference, the full superposition of the three lattice beams, but only two of them. We're able to load atoms into our new uh, square lattices. Uh, so essentially in the same uh, kind of geometries we achieved before. Uh, here you can see a nice uh, mot insulator uh, and band insulator uh, at different, uh, uh, in different shells in this, in this fluorescence picture. Uh, at U of T of T, we manage temperatures which might be actually, which are at least as good uh, as our previous temperatures uh, obtained for, for, for the anti uh, in our AFM uh, long range correlation paper. But do you have a harmonic trap or not? We don't have an anomonic trap here, so we still uh, haven't uh, you know, fully revived our DMD and we have a harmonic confinement here. So the temperatures are here estimated based on the, on the, on the maximum uh, spin correlations we are seeing at a given radius uh, from the center. Do you have a sense of why it just is colder? We can come to that later. I mean, I think, you know, 
There have been many things that have been changed uh, during the upgrade. Uh, certainly, you know, having new lattices and, uh, and uh, better stability, that I think helps. Alignment too. Uh, yeah, maybe a more basic question is, do you think it's because of the triangular lattice or because of technical upgrades or both? For, for, for this, we don't, so we, 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 sorry, this we is don't, square. this is square, sorry, sorry, that's sorry, the square, sorry, yeah, sorry. that's the square, I'll come to the triangle later, but uh, yeah, the square lattice is a little bit better and smoothly technical. So, so, just, so yeah. there is parabolic confinement. Yeah, there is parabolic confinement. Eventually it will be flat. Will be, uh, will flat, yeah. but I mean, it's uh, this one, like this one. So. But it is the square lattice realized with the new beam, yeah, okay, anyway. Yeah, the new technical beams, but still the old geometry, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do the spacings compare in the tunneling rates? So uh, spacing is, uh, is the same in this square geometry. Um, we can also realize this checkerboard of geometry with spacing which is uh, uh, enhanced by square root 2. Okay. Uh, in this geometry, we haven't optimized everything, but uh, here tem temperatures, prelim preliminary temperatures look more like 50% of the, of the tunnel. And uh, of course, if you were to zoom in on this uh, fluorescence picture, we can really nicely um, uh, resolve actually uh, uh, in the checkerboard lattice, uh, atoms being only occupying half the <coughs> sites that you would expect in the square lattice. So that's uh, it's pretty beautiful. All right, so based on this, uh, on this new lattice geometry, what's the simplest uh, kind of new non-trivial lattice geometry we can, we can achieve? And uh, we turn to uh, looking at triangular geometries. Um, and so maybe counterintuitively for many of you, these triangular connectivities can be actually achieved by using only two <coughs> interfering beams only. And that can be really seen uh, when starting from a, a checkerboard lattice, uh, which is again this 45 degree rotated uh, square lattice. If you were to decrease the power in one of the lattice beams, the depth of one of the lattice beams, you would go in the, in the limit of full anisotropy to a uh, couple of one lead chains. And in between, uh, you would expect to enhance tunneling along one of the diagonals of this square, uh, square packet, uh, as you see here. And so, essentially, we don't have a triangular, uh, a triangular like, let's say, a, a geometrical, spatial geometry, but we have triangular connectivity as shown by, this, uh, by, by these red lines. And if they didn't, we were asking about the kind of tunneling rates we can achieve. Because of the larger spacing, uh, we need to work uh, at lower lattice depths, but we can still reach about 300 hertz. Uh, but you're still in the tight binding regime there? Yeah. What's the timing I'll come to that uh, later. Of course, uh, you've seen uh, Peter's uh, like your beautiful results from yesterday. Uh, there has been a, uh, a lot of effort uh, trying to implement uh, triangular lattices under the microscope, and uh, Peter showed uh, really uh, the, uh, the measurement of uh, near stable spin correlations in the, in the Martin Sumiti regime. Uh, of course, uh, other Bose, uh, Bose, Fermi gas, uh, Bose gas microscopes have been implemented, and so we can even start having our own like little family picture of all the triangular lattice uh, uh, in front of gas microscopes. And so, why uh, why is it interesting to look at triangular lattices now? Obviously, because it brings some geometry frustration uh, between the spins, which reduces strongly uh, AFM correlations. Uh, in condensed matter experiments, uh, these triangular lattices are thought to describe some organic uh, salts, um, which uh, have been investigated pretty, pretty heavily uh, in order to, because it is thought that in certain parameter regimes, uh, these, 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 uh, these, uh, these materials can host spin liquid field phases. So there has been a, an in, like intense theoretical like research about uh, about. Um, about uh, looking at the, the ground state properties that have feeling or only uh, of these triangular lattices. And it is still debated what kind of transition you get from a metal at low U over T to an insulator at large U over T. There might be some spin liquid phase in between. There's maybe some skyro or stripe AFM order, and this is still uh, kind of an open question. I want to emphasize, because we can precisely tune the anisotropy uh, between the turn links uh, in, uh, in our triangular lattices, I want to emphasize that uh, uh, it is interesting to actually go away from the isotropic lattice configuration. We can gain a bit of understanding by going to the large U over T limit uh, in the Heisenberg regime. There you expect, uh, as you change anisotropy, here described by the ratio between this diagonal bond T prime to, uh, let's say, the square placket bond T, you have a a transition between a nail or an antiferromagnetic collinear colli colli order uh, with um, like perfect uh, anti correlations between neighboring, uh, neighboring uh, spins. 
to a 120 antiferromagnetic order, which is uh, uh, not collinear, where I mean, you can already see that in a, in a, in a classical case to minimize uh, uh, spin, uh, spin interaction energy, every uh, spin on a triangular plaquette is 120 degrees away from each other. And in between, it's still also uh, kind of an open question, What's, where is the location of the uh, phase transition and nature of the phase transition between these two limits? Again, uh, quite a lot of, uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting results uh, in numerics, but definitely we need a little bit more to describe, uh, describe the system. And I will add also that actual materials that I've shown in the previous slides are actually located at, at anisotropies which are <laughs> actually uh, relevant uh, and, and that are actually quite large. So uh, that model is really uh, what you want to look at for investigating real state materials. All right, so now uh, moving to the expandable results. Um, here we get, I mean, it's, uh, it's maybe a bit obscured by these by this kind of contour lines. So you can see uh, essentially our checkerboard lattice, well, our checkerboard slash triangular lattice being loaded, uh, um, which has kind of an anisotropic shape. Uh, we can, uh, due to anisotropic trap confinement, we can look at uh, nearest neighbor spin correlations uh, at regions of uh, equal density. Uh, since uh, the, the system is anisotropic, we are binning over elliptical bins. Here. And, uh, ah, yeah. Five, Five minutes, okay. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. Uh, and uh, at interactions close to uh, 10, uh, and again, this is preliminary data, so we haven't calibrated everything. Uh, 10 times the tunneling, and as isotropic as we can get, uh, we see near stable correlations along the triangular bonds to achieve about uh, 6, 7%, 8%. Um, weakly anisotropic, uh, maybe uh, within like 1 to 2% of each other. How are these normalized? If you had two aligned spins, would it go to 1 or would it go to L1 half? Um, one half. Oh, I had, uh, like, yeah, so still pretty weak, uh, pretty weak uh, correlations. And again, these correlations maybe in the in the best squalates we got were peaking at uh, thirty percent, minus thirty percent in the squalates. Yeah, and so here the yeah this is the the, the halving point, and we, we can also look at correlations as a function of, of filling um, as well. Tell us how, how did you measure this correlation just by blowing away yeah, so, the species and measuring yeah, yeah. what's left. So we, are, we, are, we don't have a spin charge <coughs> uh, uh, resolved imaging yet, and we are looking at two points uh, as the as the correlators. Uh, just by looking really an up and up. And up and up, yeah. yeah. We can also look at uh, uh, next uh, nearest neighbor correlations, and here. Uh, so yeah, I, I want to emphasize also the temperatures here, which are a bit larger than the ones we got uh, in the checkerboard and square lattice, about 0.8 to 1 times the, the time. And also look at the uh, next nearest uh, correlations, which in this 120 uh, antiferromagnetic phase uh, would be expected to be uh, uh, aligned, uh, positively aligned to each other. And uh, we might see a little sign of positive correlations, but again, uh, error bars are quite large and uh, you know, we, we don't want to to be able to state any anything that's uh, that's uh, longer range that nearest neighbor correlations uh, yet. And so, how much does density fluctuate in the region where you measure? Uh, so we can actually account for that by simply uh, measuring uh, uh, like binning correlations uh, among sites that have exactly the same measured density. Um, but uh, typically, so as you're moving uh, away from the center to the, the rim, you go from say a bit more than 90% uh, filling to, uh, to, uh, to zero. And uh, uh, I think it's maybe a bit, uh, given the, pre the fact that the data is preliminary, it's hard to state any, any quantitative number about, uh, let's say, um, fluctuations from site to site of the, of the density. Maybe you can, uh, our statistical errors are not, uh, not that low yet. Yeah. Uh, why did the error bars go down at larger distance? Uh, here? Yeah. Um, I mean, <coughs> very significantly. Yeah, I mean, the way, so again, uh, this is normalized radius. Um, um, I mean, here we don't, uh, I mean, we are, we, are, we are going to a regime where we don't have any, 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 any density, uh, density at all, and we are, we are also binning over, over uh, um, yeah. 
Yes, but normally, I mean, you have less statistics and less density at larger distance. That is how it normally looks. So okay. you have small error bars because you have many pairs at short distance and then you have less at large. Okay. But it's doing the opposite here. Okay. That's why. This is preliminary data. Uh, I think I outlawed the preliminary data that can me to look a bit better. Okay. Where, yeah. But uh, you're, you're right here. Yeah. yeah, so I think yeah, here we, we try to bin over like a uh, bins with an equal number of you know, sites. So in principle, I agree uh, the correlation should be, um, the error bar should be. So yeah. But again, um, OK. I think there are vast many users going on start here. Uh, you can get uh, plot these correlations in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a color plot as you have here, uh, and compare them with the squarish geometry. I mean, here we don't have exactly square, but maybe a quarter of the quarter anisotropy, and you can really see the transition between uh, these AFM correlations in the square lattice to uh, AFM correlations on the three uh, neighbors of, uh, of, uh, of a given site on the other lattice, and anything, and anything in between. We can also uh, plot these correlations as a function of an tunneling anisotropy, and uh, as uh, you would expect uh, already uh, in, uh, in, in when going from this uh, NL to 120 uh, order, you have one of the spin correlations which is expected to go from negative to positive, uh, positive to negative as you go from square to checker wall, namely this green bar here, uh, which we see quite nicely. So going from uh, uh, a line to weekly uh, entire line. The point at which this uh, correlator goes to zero is about um, an anisotropy of one half, which is compatible with uh, determinant QMC calculations. And, uh, He's in the audience, but uh, Richard Scaletta actually had uh, uh, had some uh, DQMC calculations from uh, about ten years ago, which exactly uh, you know showed that uh, that result uh, in the uh, in the temperature regime uh, we are interested in, and uh, we have pretty nice agreement actually uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the reversal of the of the of the correlations. Is alpha t over t prime? Um, in the plot um, here, yeah. is alpha t over t prime? Or I think it's the uh, uh, t prime uh, over t, so it's uh, really like here, uh, going from a square uh, to uh, a square to a triangular geometry as you go from red to, uh, to, uh, to uh. So here it's a plot as a function of entropy per particle or uh, conversely uh, temperature. And we also see uh, a decrease of the uh, uh, of this other nearest neighbor correlations, uh, which is partially due to the fact we have frustration, but also partially due that we are heating uh, technically, and that's something we still need to work on, from about 50% of the tunneling to like uh, one tunneling or 80% of the tunneling uh, as we go to triangular uh, All right, so we've got that. So we need to work on temperatures and, uh, and data analysis <coughs> and so on. Um, next steps would be, of course, to uh, leverage the fact we have, uh, in principle, a particle whole as asymmetric band structure to look at uh, effects of doping. And uh, we know that. Uh, uh, there, there are like a particle hole um, asymmetries uh, already in uh, like real state uh, real state materials. It's very interesting. Uh, something that's probably very relevant and interesting for many of you, uh, many of the theorists here in the, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the room, is that we can actually also using the super lattice uh, create square lattices with both diagonal uh, tunnelings, which are actually non-negligible, uh, about uh, like 30 percent of the tunneling, and also. Um, well, you can also reach like uh, more fancy geometries uh, by uh, using our DMDs and possibly kicking out a few sites out of this uh, out of this lattice. And finally, we can also uh, prepare adiabatically uh, low entropy states uh, from a band insulator, as has been mentioned in, uh, in previous talks. Uh, so, so let me acknowledge uh, my team. Uh, Muching has been uh, the senior students and very deeply involved into this experimental upgrade, aided in the lab by Lef and Anant. Yuchi joined us very recently. Marcus is, uh, is guiding us. Uh, thanking also the three collaborators for the Peron uh, part, Annabelle, uh, Fabian, and Eugene. And of course, uh, the entire team for their, for their input. Uh, thank you for your attention. So the triangle lens, do you see any charge correlations? We haven't looked at that. More of a theory question is the 
do you know, so you sort of, the temperature of the triangular lattice was higher than the square lattice, is the entropy per particle comparable? To, have you tried like ramping in and ramping out to see whether mm, the density is worse, it, for example? No, it's expected to change, of course, because as you're going to the triangular lattice, you get a much more, much larger degeneracy of the, the spin state as you're going to this, um, this kind of triangular phases, at least in the Heisenberg, uh, Heisenberg limit. Uh, so uh, we haven't done that. There are also perspectives, I think, um, mentioned the Pomeranchian cooling going from one geometry to another to maybe at fixed entropy per particle reduce temperature. Um, but yeah, definitely there are like some effects as that should be. Can you go back to the to the to the figure for a second? Yeah. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. I usually don't come to you know in the spirit of communicating between two different co communities. But I would say that what that figure shows is a disagreement between the experiment and the density function of theory. But if you do the Hubble model calculation, then you see at the energy scale of J, there's a really good agreement between Hubble model and the experiment. But at a lower temperature, J, in our case, the 3,000 Kelvin. As you go to even lower temperature and a lower energy scale, then the additional emergence of disagreement between the simple Hubble type of physics and what is observed. So there's a hierarchy of temperature or energy scale in our case. But at the level of J, or a fraction of J, the Hubble model did a very good job. That's why what I said yesterday, it was a necessary, but appeared to be at even lower temperature, there's additional emerging properties, which is very rich. And that's why I saw the communication between the community would be very fruitful for both of us. Because you have a cleaner system, but at the moment we can go to lower temperature. That's, that's what I tried to say. So, at a very high level, yeah, that could be a good agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, another question. Well, so, uh, so you focused a lot on the magnetism here uh, and had beautiful measurements, but like you showed at the start of the talk, and it showed uh, there's this metal insider transition. Um, is there anything interesting to look at there? You know, looking at equations of state or correlations there? Yeah, you had the Interesting discussions also with Antoine George, uh, where in principle you could try, uh, and that's you know data data that's also included in like the NLC calculations of Kepler. Uh, you can look at uh, compressibility, for example, as a function of uh, your T and possibly look at signatures even at high temperatures of the transition there. Uh, so definitely looking at uh, the equation of state uh, there could be could be interesting. So spin susceptibility, of course, uh, if you want to look at the spin sector. Yeah. Yeah, do you have an idea why the temperature uh, is larger in these different geometries, or even in the larger spacing so relatives? So is it just like energy scales that, that T so is lower? Um, so, um, I mean, we think it's mostly uh, mostly technical in the sense that we need to rely on uh, this phase lock to work uh, properly to have like little noise and not no heating. Uh, uh, we need also to work a bit on, on the on the on the ramps into the triangular lattice uh, because you know if you are not very careful in how you ramp up your lattice powers, you might actually even go through a transition from checkerboard to triangular lattice as you are ramping up power. So and, and you're already there uh, creating excitations. So it's not totally clear, and we have just started uh, to work on temperature so far. So mostly probably temperature uh, technically. All right, so it's time to wrap up. Uh, let's thank my friend again.